Hello, and welcome to Great Times Behind the Wines. This show reveals what goes on behind the bar at a family-owned winery in the beautiful Finger Lakes wine country of New York State. It also aims to educate listeners of all wine knowledge levels about the techniques, tradition, and teamwork that go into every bottle. I'm your host, Shannon Hasmian, as always. Today, we are going to learn about a key part of the winemaking process for many wines, the oak barrels. We have a special conversation planned with Doug Hazlitt, co-CEO of Hazlitt 1852 Vineyards and Winery, and Michael Reedy, the Vinifera winemaker. Vinifera, for those newer to the world of wine, refers to Graker. Vinifera, for those newer to the world of wine, refers to grapes of European origins that have become known for making incredible wines here in the U.S. They include many you've probably heard of, such as Merlot, Riesling, and Chardonnay. Hoover says Chardonnay is his favorite. Luckily, we'll be talking quite a bit about Hazlitt Sparrow fermented Chardonnay. Luckily, we'll be talking quite a bit about Hazlitt Sparrow fermented Chardonnay today, and we'll compare it and the qualities the oak gives it to Hazlitt Stainless Steel fermented Chardonnay. My aunt Lee, my father's sister, and Hazlitt co CEO prefer Chardonnay made without oak fermentation. So Hazlitt also offers a Chardonnay that is fermented in stainless steel tanks rather than oak barrels. Chardonnay also goes by the name of Doug Chardonnay, since this was my father's preferred way of making a Chardonnay with oaked barrel fermentation. Michael, my father, and I met to discuss oak barrels and Hazlitt's two Chardonnays on a chilly mid-February afternoon at Hazlitt's original tasting room location in Hector, New York, near the shores of Seneca Lake. As we spoke, we each the Chardonnay, since the oak fermented was still in production. You'll learn much more about this production process from Michael and my father in the conversation to come. First, Dad, could you please describe the friendly sibling competition behind Lee's stainless steel fermented Chardonnay and Doug's barrel fermented Chardonnay? Well, yeah, that actually is kind of a fun little competition that we have, and it's a Chardonnay because it makes people sort of ask the question, now what's what's going on with the Lee's and the Doug Chardonnay? But the gist of it is um, uh, there are two different ways of making Chardonnay, and one is to ferment in stainless steel and not have the, uh, the barrel fermented characteristics, and the other way, obviously, is to ferment in the barrel, which has its own. I always liked a barrel fermented Chardonnay, and it was a very traditional way of making Chardonnay. And Lee wasn't wild about the, the little bit of oakiness flavor and the characteristic you get from fermenting in the barrel. So she wanted to do a stainless steel one. So neither one of us wanted to fight the other one. So we just thought, you know what? One of us wanted to fight the other one. So we just thought, you know what? Why don't we just make both and we'll, uh, we'll see who sells better. <laughs> We'll leave that for the listener to decide for now. Now, Dad and Michael, could you please dive into a brief overview of the process of using the oak barrels to make wines like the Chardonnay and the difference between aging and fermenting in oak? Yeah, um, when, you do, when you do Chardonnay, there's, again, a couple different ways that you can do it. Uh, the most traditional way is a barrel fermented Chardonnay. And what you do is you bring in your grapes and you um, stem and crush them. And then you take the juice and put it directly into an individual barrel. Um, we use 60 gallon barrels and you actually ferment the juice to wine in the barrel. And that gives it not so much an oaky flavor, but it's just a different characteristic of, of a flavor that you get. And I, I think probably Michael can speak a little bit more to that. Yeah. A big, a big part of it is, is, you know, the fermentation that happens in barrel. A lot of it is it's, it's this, the, sh the size of the barrel and the fermentation that happens in barrel. A lot of it is it's, it's this, the, sh the size of the barrel and the constant contact with lees. Lees is the uh, the yeast, dead and dying yeast at the bottom. So there's a creaminess and a texture that comes to it uh, from fermenting in barrel. And it just gives it a, a nicer, an o more overall body, but also in reaction with the oak and these constantly, there's reactions that happen and you just get a different flavor and textural profile. So that's that's the big thing. And, and for me personally, I, I definitely like barrel fermented Chardonnay. Um, it's a winemaker's kind of, it's a winemaker's grape. It, it's it's very malleable and it kind of does what you want it to do. So for me, just regular old Chardonnay is just kind of boring. So I like it. I prefer doing. I used to do it a bunch, and I did it. Actually, I did it uh, comparatively. I had two barrels that were the same age sitting next to each other in a rack, and I stirred. You know, right at the beginning of fermentation, or at the end of fermentation, I stirred up because I don't want it to have a reductive characteristic in the wine and to kind of you know break it up for all the stuff that's been compacted in there. But I did one. I stirred one it up for all the stuff that's been compacted in there, but I did one I stirred once every month or so, and I did one I stirred every couple of weeks. And really, in the end, there wasn't a huge, huge difference in the two. 
Uh, and I actually preferred the, uh, the o I overall preferred the one that was served less. So we definitely do it at the beginning, but it not nearly as much as, uh, we do it at the beginning, but it not nearly as much as uh, we used to, but there's a funny little tool that, you know, just goes in the top of the barrel and it gets down to the bottom, it flattens out. When you stir it, you can actually see the one at the top, it's clear. And after you stir it for a little bit, it's all cloudy again because the leaves, the yeast have come back up at the top. So that's a, that's a big thing. Oh, cool. But that's a, that's a big thing in barrel eight. Barrel is one thing, but for the Chardonnay, it sits in barrel for a, usually at least a year. What I like to do is they take out the previous year's wine just as I'm putting in the, the next year's juice. So it typically stays in there for about, for about a year. And we, the process is called Sir Lee aging. So Sir means on and Lee is you know, Lee's. So it, it'll aging. So Sir means on and Lee is you know, Lee's. So it, it'll stay in there for about a year sitting on that stuff. And it just it def, it definitely adds a character and a textural element to it that you don't get if you just you know ferment and take your your wine off the lees. Yeah, well, the other way some people do it to go back to your question is you can ferment the Chardonnay barrel for aging, and that's more just to give you a an oaky flavor to the wine. So that is actually quite a bit different process than if you actually ferment the wine in the barrel. And uh, Michael and I both prefer fermenting it in the barrel, and then again about a year aging after the fermentation is complete. It, it, I think a lot of it, with the, the over, especially when you're using newer barrels, it helps to mitigate some of that excessive oakiness that sometimes you can get. The, you, know, you can definitely cross the line where it just, it's too much oak. It's, it's overshadowing the wine itself. You know, the oak should be a component of the, of the wine. It should be a nuance, but it shouldn't dominate everything. So the lees actually will help the stuff that's dominate everything. So the lees actually will help, the stuff that's in there will actually help kind of you know, mitigate that that uh, flavor. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. That was a great description. Thank you so much. Now, Michael, could you please touch on the other wines that are aged or fermented in oak here at Hazlitt? Sure. We do uh, We do th our three, our Bordeaux reds, Cab Franc, Cab Sauve, and Merlot, and then the are fermented in stainless steel tanks. Or occasionally, if the lot is small, if we're running short on tank space, we'll do bin fermentation, which is, you know, the same bin the grapes came in on. We, we crush the grapes and then we put them in the thing. We actually do it in there, but majority of our wine, our reds are fermented in, in red tank. Then they're drained off um, and they go through a second, drained off um, and they go through a second fermentation process and then they go to oak barrels for aging. And that's anywhere from, you know, one to almost two years. We've gone two years before in aging stuff. Um, and the Chardonnay is the, is, you know, the unique one where it's actually done. The aging is actually done um, after fermentation that's occurred in barrel. Oh, okay. Cool. And about how long barrels? Um, we've been using oak barrels. <laughs> it's kind of a funny story behind this. Um, we started using oak barrels probably about, oh, 10 years into, um, our wine production. So we started in 84 or so probably about 94. We, my brother and I, my brother, Phil and I, my brother, Phil decided that we wanted to do the more traditional barrel aging and fermentation. And um, my dad, who obviously was running the show back then, he was dead set against oak barrels. And he said, the only thing oak is good for is floors and toilet seats. <laughs> so the first barrels that we brought in, um, we actually snuck them. We snuck them when he wasn't looking. We snuck them in and we put some of our reds and we aged in the in the barrels. And it all it all turned out good in the end. But it was, it was a rough start for the barrels when, when we first started the winery back in 84. But uh, they're a big part of our... Uh, whole process now. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. And could you please describe what these barrels um, They're just what you would picture a barrel looking like. They're um, round on the ends and they have a kind of a unique curve shape to them. I mean, just, just what you would think a normal barrel looks like. There are lots of different um, other types and shapes of barrels that Michael can probably talk to you about. Uh, so we have three, there are three, there are three basic types of barrels that we have currently in the barrel room. We have there are, t there are two different types that are the standard barrel size, and they run around 59 to 60 gallons, or the French like to use liters. It's 225 liters. So there are the two styles I have is the, the Bordeaux style, which is longer with a less pronounced curve, curve. Uh, and then there's the Burgundy style, which is shorter and a little squatter with a, with a more pronounced curve, but they hold about the same amount of wine. So those are the two. Uh, and then we've started recently going into a larger format, uh, they call them punchins, which I really like. Um, they're they're 500 liters each. So for each barrel, you're getting for each punchin, you get about two, um, times the volume of a standard barrel. So 
it's, it's less topping. You only have to go to one or two barrels instead of, you know, five or six barrels. Uh, and I like it because it, it actually, even a newer barrel, you get less of that fresh raw oak kind of toasted oak flavor because it's a surface area to volume ratio. You know, surprisingly, these things are, you know, surface area to volume ratio. You know, surprisingly, these things are, you know, hold two, and a, two times the amount of wine, but I can still pick up an empty barrel just like I can pick up an empty, uh, um, empty punch like I can pick up an empty barrel. So there's a, there's a lot less surface area to the volume you're getting. So it just kind of, it helps even like a newer, even like a newer barrel that usually you break in for a couple of years before it, uh, before it's, before it's in a really nice spot. That's, that's a nice element that we have. So we've, we started using some punch-ins in the last couple of years, which I really like. So Michael, is there a difference in, I mean, why do they have a Bordeaux style and a Burgundy style barrel and does it change the flavor any? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with, I can't really speak to anything. I'm sure it has something to do with, it probably has something to do with space and what, you know, and you know, what they had, the, what was available and what they were trying to do. I mean, it's all the same wood. Uh, and then, you know, the, it's interesting. Oak is one of the reasons the oak is used is it's actually a very uh, malleable uh, wood. It's very easy to bend and make into barrel shapes. So the malleable wo uh, wood, it's very easy to bend and make into barrel shapes. So that's one of the reasons it's actually became uh, the, the wood of choice for making oak barrels. Also, oak was everywhere. So the guys that actually started making oak barrels as a, as a means for storage was like, well, what trees are out there? Like, oh, there's just lots and lots of oak. So that was that was trees are out there like oh there's just lots and lots of oak so that was that was big in the in in europe and that's you know it's kind of one of those things where it never no one ever sat there and said hey you know i really like the idea of a toasted oak in my wine but it was it, out of necessity the barrels were born and then it was kind of a happy mistake that it actually does impart flavors and things that people cared about what a happy accident michael could you please just talk a little more about the history of using oak barrels it really was just necessity the Romans, when they went places, they brought wine and they used to bring uh, clay amphoras. So it was you know, this big clay pot and they would seal it up and they would take it everywhere. And as they, you know, but those things could break and they were, you know, you'd have to make them out of clay. And as they, you know, but those things could break and they were, you know, you'd have to make them out of clay. But that is waterproof. Uh, so they would have that. But the, what happened was when they started expanding into Europe, Northern Europe, uh, there were people in, I want to say Egyptian, Egypt in this area, they were using palm wood to make barrels. So they were barrels, but they were really hot. So when they got up into New York, like France and stuff, the Romans saw the, the, you know, the people up there, the Gauls were using oak barrels, wooden oak, oak barrels to transport beer and store beer in. And they said, oh, this works great. And that, and that's where it comes from. It's not, it wasn't something, like I said, no one just said, Hey, this is what we're doing. Uh, and afterwards using it, storing it, moving it around the accident. So it just very quickly, they went from all these clay amphoras to using wood barrels. And that was, you know, millennia ago. And they've been doing doing that ever since. Yeah, it makes sense. And I know new oak and old oak are like pretty popular terms used when you talk about oak, right? Could you talk about the difference between those two terms? Sure. Uh, I mean, new oak is, new oak is a brand new barrel. Sure. Uh, I mean, new oak is, new oak is a brand new barrel. And there's, you know, different characteristics. There's, there are, there, you know, there's Hungarian oak, there's American oak, there's French oak. Um, they're all a little different. They're all white oak species. They're, they're a couple different species. You know, they're species at the end, but they are white oaks. But a new barrel is a barrel that just came in. It's being used maybe the first or second new flavor out of the barrel. Uh, an old oak or a neutral oak is something that's been used up a bit. Well, the funny thing about it is, is what's happened is over the time, the oak that's, you know, contacting the wood has been coated with tartrates and yeast. And it's kind of, there's a, there's a, you know, a layer in there that is keeping the wet is keeping the wine from directly interacting with as much of the oak as there was. You can open a barrel, you can pop the top off a barrel, shave it down and retoast it in its new oak again. So the flavor is there. You just got to go in and, you know, basically pressure wash it or sand it down and then and re refire it up. And it's going to be, it's going to taste like new oak. And then and re refire it up and it's going to be, it's going to taste like new oak. So when they say new oak versus old oak is essentially what they're meaning is how much barrel, how much the barrel impacts and, and imparts a flavor of oak or, you know, things like clove or cinnamon or vanilla to the wine itself. Gotcha. Our new oak can actually be a pretty old barrel, but it's just been. We can, yeah, we can recondition it, you know, so that's, it's, it's not so much the age of the oak or age of the barrel. It's the, it's what you're, it, it's imparted. So you get a lot of new oak. That means that you can taste it. You really, it's like, oh, that's a new, a new, new oak. 
Gotcha. And you mentioned tartrates. Can you just describe what that is, please? Sure. Tartrates are um, acid. It's a well, tartaric acid is great. I put it in the freezer and kind of forgot about it, and it froze. And then you had the thought back out. There was a little, you know, crystally diamonds at the bottom. That's that's a tartaric acid salt. So it's basically falling out of solution. So when tartaric acid is very soluble in water and it's less soluble in alcohol. So over a period of time, uh, the, the tartrate will come out of solution and it forms little crystals and drops out. So it happens in tanks when we ferment in there um, and in barrels, it does the same thing. It just kind of comes out and you know, what better place for a crystal to form than you need a little nucleation site. So a little, little bump on the inside of the oak or a, you know, a little piece and all of a sudden the crystals start forming crystals start forming and the more you use the barrel, the more tartrates you get built up. Yeah. And sometimes you'll see, if you open a bottle of wine, um, you'll see the crystals on the cork. Mm -hmm. And again, that's the, the same thing. It's just the tartrates come out of solution. And um, what most winemakers do is you make, you actually cold stabilize your wine before you bottle it so that that doesn't happen in the bottle. It doesn't always work perfectly. But um, so we just get the wine really, really cold in the winter time, hopefully and let all those tartrates drop out either in the barrel or in the tank so that when you put it in the bottle, if you happen to forget it in your freezer, which happens, um, they won't drop out in the bottle and you won't happens. Um, they won't drop out in the bottle and you won't drink the last sip of wine and get a mouthful of tartaric acid crystals. They don't hurt you. They're totally fine. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with them at all. And actually some people in, you know, like the French consider it to be, well, Americans are inherently flaw based consumers. We see something, it's like, that's not right. And it's, it's definitely changed over. Over the years, I'm Hector, 14 years ago, there were two kinds of beer you drank. You either drank a PBR, or if you got the fancy beer, it was Sierra Nevada. And then Sierra Nevada always had the little ring of yeast at the bottom because they didn't filter it all the way down. Um, so that was you know the fancy beer. And now everywhere you go, it's all cloudy beers and juice bombs and all this you know hazy stuff that you know 10 years ago, people, you know, hazy stuff that you know, 10 years ago, people would have been freaking oh, out about God, it. What is that? What is that? <laughs> so in Europe, when they see tartrates in, bear, in a bottle, it's like they know that, you know, it's it's very, it's natural if you want to say, but, you know, like Doug said, if you do it in the wintertime right now, it's, you know, there's a reason it's 25 degrees in the cellars and the heat's off and it's cold in there is because I don't want to. Um, could you please describe how the barrel room is set up and why it's set up that way? Uh, yeah, I mean, the barrel room is basically, it's a, it's a room that we try to maintain a certain, uh, so we've got a heater, an air conditioner, uh, a humidifier that work in there. So in the summertime, you've got, you know, the, uh, the AC is running. The problem is it, you've got, you know, the, uh, the AC is running. The problem is it also dries the air out, but it's usually humid around here. So we try to keep it around 60% humidity and 60 per, uh, degrees Fahrenheit, which is ex essentially what it would be in a cave or underground. So we're trying to simulate that. The reason is because you don't want it too hot or too, too cold. So we're trying to simulate that. The reason is because you don't want it too hot or too, too cold for the wine because they, you want enzymatic reactions to be going on. Uh, but you don't want to be too dry because if it's dry, then you're, the amount of wine that is evaporating in the barrel is elevated, but you don't want it too wet because then you got things growing in there and there's problems. So that pop up. So, um, that's the one thing I just kind of, you know, keep an eye on is, you know, what's the temperature, what's the humidity, um, got a couple little thermo thermostats and, uh, hydrometers in, in the room. And I can just go like, all right, guess what? I got to turn the humidifier on today or, you know, uh, the AC is, is doing its job. So. It's, yeah. it's kind of funny that way. Yeah, and a lot of job. So it's, yeah. it's kind of funny that way. Yeah, and a lot of the older wineries and even newer wineries, if people have the money, they will actually dig caves. And that's because back, you know, hundreds of years ago, they didn't have air conditioning and humidifiers and all that stuff. So the best place to put your barrels of wine where it was consi consistent, you know, in the summer, it's still this temperature, it's still this humidity in the winter, you know, it's not going to be affected by the warmth or the, or the coldness of the season. It's pretty consistent. So yeah, that's a, a perfect way of saying it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And I believe it's changed right from where it is. It was historically a different place in the winery. Can you describe, you know, where it was and where it is now? Uh, I mean, we're sitting, we're sitting in a barrel room. What well, was a barrel room when I, when I first came here in 06. And it's just as, as, as the company's grown and moved around and, you know, necessity has moved around for things. So th this became, we, you know, we, the company needed a conference room. So we had a conference room and then it, we had the barrel room at the end of the, the office building, uh, for a number of years, a room at the end of the, the office building, uh, for a number of years. And then we moved it up to its current location in the, off the, uh, warehouse. I want to say probably back in 2000 and 
10 or 11 because it used to hold the bottling line that's here that then went and went over to Naples. So we, uh, it's a good place for barrels to go in there. Yeah, it's jumped around enough that I can't even remember where it is anymore. <laughs> Great. All right. And can you also talk about, I've, I've always been curious, you know, how do you um, go about ordering these barrels? Like how do they, you know, where do they come from basically? Um, they, well, it depends. You can get barrels made. I mean, traditionally everyone loves, the traditionally everyone loves the French oak barrels and they're actually my favorite, but you can also get barrels made in um, Hungary. They're popular. Um, um, U.S. barrels are, are popular. So, I mean, it just depends on wherever you harvest the, the wood from. And the and the white oak trees are different in different regions, and you you and you you actually can tell the, the difference. So depending on what style of wine you're making, or and Michael will talk a little bit more about that, you can pick the region where you want to get it. The French barrels are the most expensive, and lo most people consider them the best. But other barrels have different characteristics as well. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with where it's grown. Like Doug, like Doug said, it's uh, it's. Again, I said it's a very it's a very malleable wood, but it's also a very tight grained wood and very dense, which makes it waterproof or watertight. So that's what's one of the reasons is you don't really have any leakage or seepage uh, in that. So that's one of the reasons. And you know, most of the oak you get uh, around from the United States if you're making oak barrels, typically oak comes out of Minnesota, very cold kind of cl uh, continental climate. Europe you get it in Hungary and France and the the more northern regions. So it it, it it, it does, it's interesting that, that aspect. There were a number of, a couple of years ago, there were some oaks, there were some barrels that were made, being made by a cooperage in Pennsylvania that used a cooperage in Pennsylvania that used in New York oak. And uh, they, they tried, never really, never really caught on with the area. But a lot of people believe that you should be using, you know, from, from the area. But I, again, with Doug, I'm, I'm a big, a big proponent of French oak and I do like Hungarian the best or uh, as well um american oak is probably my least favorite but it's my favorite for bourbon it's got this um a, a vanillin which is this vanilla character which uh it, it and you can also get coconut you really get a kind of coconut flavor it's great for american barrels or for american whiskeys and bourbons and stuff like that but i don't like it so much in my wines i think i like more the french and the hungarian we get a little more spice a little much in the hungarian we get a little more spice a little more like that kind of stuff, baking spices and nutmeg and cinnamon and clove. I think that's, it It lends itself better to the, the wines that we're aging. So, you know, we also have a lot of white oak growing on our farm. So we ought to just, we ought to mill up, a, a cut a couple of white oak trees down, mill it up and age the lumber and make it. Yeah, and that's what he, Doug, Doug was saying is age it and season it. So what you actually have to do is after you cut the tree down, you don't actually just make a barrel out of it. Barrel, a uh, wine, uh, well, the st thing is staves, they, they mill it down to larger pieces, but then it sits outside and it dries out to about, uh, I want to say about 12, 12, 15% humidity or uh, water, 12, 15% humidity or uh, water content. So it sits outside and they call it seasoning. Uh, and it's, it's a minimum of two years up to four years that they'll actually let the, the stuff sit there. And, and, and some of the more harsh chemicals and terpenes and, and things like that are actually, they degrade at that point in time. So if you went and made a barrel easier by letting it dry out and, and do its thing. So typically from uh, Hazlitt's is I like three year uh, uh, aged uh, barrels. So three year season wood. And actually you can tell it's just not as, it's not as rough and oaky, even in the first use. You know, I've done, I've gotten two year aged and three year aged from the same cooperage, um, the same year. And you can definitely two year aged and three year aged from the same cooperage, um, the same year. And you can definitely, you can definitely pick up the difference. Yeah. Makes sense. Can you just go back to explain a little bit more about how the different grains of wood, like in the barrel, how that in, in like impacts the flavor of the wine? Sure. Uh, so the biggest thing used to be, you know, when you get French barrels, it was all these, the, the forests were the important thing. So the limousine forests, it was all these, the, the forests were the important thing. So the limousine forests and the LEA forests um, and a bunch of different places. And they said, you know, the different forests were, you know, tighter grain or looser grained. Um, and, you know, the, the tighter the grain, the nicer the, you know, the, the, the more elegant the barrel would be. And they've found out that, yeah, while that is true, the forests are located. So some are more northern, so they're going to be tighter grain. Uh, so this, the wood grows, it's, you know, the, the growth rings, if you look at a growth ring, it's, it's tighter together because they grow less over a period of time because it's colder. So there's that aspect, but then they realize that all the forests, uh, depending on, you know, what, where the tree is located, if it's on, you know, what, where the tree is located, if it's on a slope somewhere, if it's a northern facing slope, southern facing slope, every forest has its own 
Um, there's their tighter grain versus looser grain. So now it's the job of the person who goes out there and picks the tree and cuts it down and go, okay, they assign a grain. So we typically use tight grain, select, assign a grain. So we typically use tight grain, select, uh, or very tight grain. Um, and the looser the grain is, the more flavor, the more oak flavor comes out of it. That's why another reason American oak is, is, um, is more oaky per se is because the grain is, is a, it's a looser grain. It's a, it's not as tight. So there's to use oak versus stainless steel fermentation in the winemaking process. Sure. I, yes. Um, actually we've gotten to the point now where I oak, I think is, it definitely lends something. Uh, but there is, there are percentages of our reds that never see oak. So there might be 20, you know, 20% of a particular vintage blend depending on the barrel because it really maintains that fruit and that powerful characteristic uh, that I really, really like. Uh, and then you, then you can blend it in and just kind of figure something out from there. So, you know, that's a big aspect of it. And, um, but yeah, I mean, essentially it's, that's, that's a big thing we do is, you know, and also it depends on the vintage year. So that's a big thing we do is, you know, and also it depends on the vintage year. So specifically for reds in a, in a really hot, dry year, like we had in 2020, where the reds are going to be big and powerful and super fruity, they can take more oak. So they, they you need to have a balance point. You can't just have, you know, you, in a cool year that the wines are a little more elegant and a little more uh, delicate. You can't just have all this big oak because it's going to overpower the wine. So that's a, that's a big thing is, you know, certain years you're going to have, you know, it's like, oh, you know, this is nicer out of the, the older oak barrels or the more neutral oak barrels, or, Hey, I want to use a slightly larger percentage for the blend that's unoaked and go in that aspect. So it really is kind of like a, you know, knowing the, vin knowing the vintages, knowing the, the vineyards are, you just kind of look at things that way. And just every year, it's a little bit of a putting the puzzle together kind of thing. Yeah. And what it really all boils down to is, is taste, mm -hmm. you know, it's a matter of taste. Some people like really yoky wines and some people don't but what we do here and what michael's very good at is we have you know is we have you know not everything goes into stainless and not everything just goes into oak we keep things separate so michael has blending tools to fine tune you know it's like well we use 10 percent of the stainless steel cabernet sauvignon and we'll blend that with 90 percent of you know the barrels are 50 percent french oak barrels 50 percent you know, blend it for the best taste possible. Yeah, that's really what it comes down to is the idea of, you know, you're trying to make the best wine. And I mean, actually we had a 2000 or 2016 Cabernet Sauvignon, which I want to say was a 90 pointer from Enthusiast, and never saw oak once. And the reason is because I was getting ready to put it in barrels and I tasted it. I'm like, this doesn't need anything. It doesn't need to do anything. This is beautiful. And we've, we actually had it went out and it was sold. The only person that actually picked up that it was not oak was a master sommelier. And they were kind of prefaced in, hey, there's something about this is unique. Why don't you taste the wine and let me know what you think? The person loved the wine, but then it was like, that's not, it wasn't oaked, was it? And then it was like, nope, that's it. But no one else could pick that up. So that's it. But no one else could pick that up. So, you know, oak is, oak is a tool. It's something to be used that, you know, if, if a wine doesn't need something, you know, don't, don't force it to be something that it doesn't need to be or shouldn't, you know, it's, which is, which is kind of nice. He didn't even tell me it was never an oak. I didn't tell any. I didn't. And I tell said, anybody. I go, well, you know, I can taste that French oak in that. It's in France. <laughs> yep. I didn't tell. I didn't tell anybody about that. I was just like, let's see what happens. And um, yeah, it was it was beautiful. And actually, we were. It was funny because we were had we had a, a somebody from um, a guest that was here helping in the cellars one day, and I had them taste it, and they were there's of importance in the wine world, and the, they they tasted. I'm like, I think I'm gonna put this in oak. They sh and she was like, why? Would they they tasted. I'm like, I think I'm gonna put this in oak. They sh and she was like, why would you? There's no reason to. This is beautiful. So that was that was fun. But that's the only time that's ever happened. That's the only time we've not oaked a, a red. Everything else is is oaked. Wow, that's awesome. And that kind of leads to another question I had. You know, are there any tips that you know wine drinkers? can use to maybe like try to, you know, some good about the, you know, barrel fermentation when they're tasting wine. So American French, Hungarian oak, big thing I would say is if you get a lot of vanilla or coconut, you're probably, it's probably American oak. Um, it just, that just, it's a, it's a, like I said, a looser grain has a, a higher uh, percentage of that vanillin chemical that really gives you that ter that characteristic. Uh, for me, French oak that really gives you that ter that characteristic. Uh, for me, French oak is it's like baking spices, so nutmeg and cinnamon, um, and Hungarian also has that as uh, as well. But I don't think it's as it, it's uh, it's it's a little more pronounced. So French can be a little more delicate, I would say. Uh, but that's charred. Like how was it? Because what they do is they heat the barrel up in order to make it bend, 
they actually fire it. You can either put it over a wood fire, that's it's usually oak, or you can use uh, water bending where you warm up water. There's a, just straight irradiation, so they're just shooting heat at it to bend it, and it chars the inside, and then that causes some chemicals, charred characteristic to it, so it's a heavy toast. You know, medium or light, you're gonna get stuff like cinnamon nutmeg, and that comes from the fact that they heat was applied to the wood. That's a that's a big thing when you when you get that, and you know everything's a little different, so it's it's a matter and different cooperages. You know, they're they're barrels. We we typically use two cooperages that I really like. I've just they're very consistent. We we typically use two cooperages that I really like. I've just they're very consistent, and and that's a big thing. But you know, the really interesting thing about barrels is, especially if you're using fire to do this, the traditional method, every barrel is different. You might buy four or five or 10 barrels that are the same barrel, same treatment, same wood, same everything, but every barrel is going to be a little bit different. Treatment, same wood, same everything, but every barrel is going to be a little bit different. So it's a matter of, you know, again, using all the tools, like Doug said, uh, going through and, you know, like, hey, I like this barrel, even, I like this barrel better than that barrel, even though they're essentially the same barrel, uh, at least, you know, on face value or what, what's written on the on the side of it. It definitely sounds rewarding though, right? And any other way or any experiences you want to share about working with uh, the, the oak barrels? Well, it's that one time I dropped one on my foot. That was a good experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. They're, they're, yeah, they're just awkward. They're they're big, awkward things. You got to move around and be careful with them. Yeah, I mean, I like when a brand new barrel comes in. It's all pretty and shiny. They aren't really shiny, but they're just, you know, they're pretty looking. And they smell really good if you stick looking. And they smell really good if you stick your nose in there. They do really smell very good. Um, yeah, I, I, I do enjoy that. I like getting I like getting new barrels and just, you know, seeing seeing what they are. And it's funny because, you know, you can definitely buy, you buy a barrel from this guy, you buy a barrel from that lady, and, you know, it's like, well, that lady's barrels are just a nicer barrel. So that's because you just, you know, over time you figure out who you like and, you know, have a good relationship with and, you know, what, what actually works with your your style of winemaking. And I, I know I use barrels here that, um, I have a particular barrel maker that I really like, and I have a friend down the road who makes amazing red wines that he, he's like, oh, I don't use those barrels. I use these barrels, but we're, we're doing we're doing very different things. And he's doing it, it works out real well. Do you talk to other winemakers just out of curiosity about like different barrels used in the region and that type of thing? Yeah, uh, definitely. We, I mean, you definitely just kind of like anything in the area, there's, you know, commodity and you, you basically just, you know, who's who do you have? Um, there's there's a friend down the road. It's actually Hector Wine Company, which is you know the other side of the family, the Hats family. Um, the winemaker there, uh, Justin Boyat, he had a uh, had a friend that she was Hungarian actually, and we uh, we started using her large format barrels a couple of years ago, and she'd been trying to get barrels into our program for a long long time. And I finally was like, all right, I'll buy some barrels. So go, oh, I really I really like them. Tong. I finally was like, all right, I'll buy some barrels. So go, oh, I really. I really like these. These are really nice. So yeah, but uh, you know, over a period of time, you, you just kind of ask people what they think. Um, you know, the barrel maker that I like the best is there was a winemaker and there is a winemaker in the area that I really liked his wines. I'm like, who's your barrel guy? And then he's like, oh, well, I use Francois. And he's like, oh, well, I use Francois Ferrer from, you know, from, from France. I'm like, okay, well, guess what? I'm going to start using these, these barrels too. So yeah, it's a lot of fun to go into someone else's winery who's doing things a little bit differently. And if you're close enough or lucky enough, the winemaker will take in and you can literally sample right out of the barrels. So, okay, this is the same wine in a French oak barrel. This is the same wine. I put some in these American barrels and, you know, to go through and taste the difference. And you really can taste the difference. It's neat. It's a lot of fun. One more quick question. What like is kind of, what happens to barrels at the end of their lifespan, I guess? Is there a certain amount of time you usually use them for? And then what maybe happens after that? You don't need them anymore. And then you turn them into planters. After that. You don't need them anymore. And then you turn them into planters and sell them at the winery. People make furniture out of them. I've seen some cool bars made out of them. Um, barrels can be, if you're just looking for, if you're just looking for a storage vessel and an aging vessel, they can be used forever. Just, you know, and, and it's your, your, you know, it's not going to get that oak flavor anymore. Uh, so there's that element of it. So yeah, but yeah, my I don't think it's on my voicemail anymore. But I would one out of every three phone calls I would get would be somebody that called the winery looking for used barrels, and they would transfer them back to the winemaker because he would know Fanny barrels. And I actually put on my my uh, outgoing message was, you know, you've reached Michael Reedy, blah 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 blah. And at the end, it's like, and if you're calling to inquire about, oh, I wouldn't get people calling me back and leaving messages. Yeah, people people love them. You can sell them as a whole barrel or planters, but. You know, people, I've seen a lot of furniture made out of them, you know, because you just take them apart and you use the curved staves. Mm -hmm. I've seen chairs made out of them. Oh, wow. A lot of cool ideas. And I'm sorry people listen to this and then give you more calls. Yeah, Michael's cell phone number is. No, it's good. <laughs> listen to this and then give you more calls. Yeah, Michael's cell phone number is. No, it's good. <laughs>
<laughs> all right well thank you guys so much cheers thank you for taking the time yeah all right as you can see there is a lot of thought and hard work that go into using oak barrels here at hazlitt but it's worth it to make incredible wines thank you so much again to my father doug hazlitt i also really appreciate derek strybeg's amazing custom music and the careful editing of the winery's director of marketing stephanie jarvis of course i also must thank you for taking the time to listen to this show <laughs> And yes, Hoover, I appreciate your contributions as well. We hope this episode has inspired you to try more wines aged or fermented in oak, which you can do at inspired you to try more wines aged or fermented in oak, which you can do at our tasting rooms located both in Hector, New York, near the shores of Seneca Lake, and in Naples, New York, near Canandaigua Lake. You can also buy Hazlitt wines online for delivery by visiting hazlitt1852.com. We hope you tune in again soon to learn more about the behind the scenes world. Cheers. <laughs>